असतो मा सद्गमय तमसो मा ज्योतिर्गमय मृत्युर्मा अमृत गमय ओ शाति 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 हरि ओ Om lead us from the unreal to the real lead us from darkness unto light lead us from death to immortality om peace 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 so in the first session we saw the divinity within when swami vivekananda says the goal of human life is to manifest the divinity already present within us that is religion the goal of religion goal of human life is that but what is meant by the divin by divinity within and we saw the two aspects of enlightenment that's where we stopped the paradigm shift that i am not what i thought earlier what i was this body mind this little person this is this body mind this little person is there but my depth reality is much vaster than that uh, i am not the body i am not the mind there is the mind and the body but i am the witness consciousness which uh, enlivens illumines this mind and body and uh, that witness consciousness not subject to birth or death it's not subject to the vagaries of the mind the ups and downs of the mind um, all problems are out there in the in the world in the body um, or even in the mind but i am this refreshingly cool and calm and uh, you know pe- ever peaceful inner witness serenely detached from everything in the universe um in one place uh, hari maharaj shami turiyanand ji disciple of sri ramakrishna is in his old age he suffered a lot from main, many uh, ailments in banaras in our uh, home of service there so one day somebody asked him maharaj khub kashto che suffering a lot is a lot of pain and then maharaj said no um Sri Ramakrishna by the grace of Sri Ramakrishna uh, everything is like is ice cold within it it doesn't work quite well unless you know the heat of banaras you know thakure kripai bhitor ta barof kore diyeche it's um like a mass of ice in it absolutely cool and peaceful that's very nice but if that's what it means that you are this ever peaceful um, like himalayan peak shining forth on a troubled world but you are you are perfectly at peace all very nice but it doesn't exist such a thing isn't there we'll see why not what is the problem with all of this and what is the deeper implication we also saw that it leads to duality earlier the duality was i am there and here is the world separate world i am separate world is separate god is separate this is dualism dvaita uh, and now i see that oh even the body is not i the mind is not i i am the witness consciousness everything else is separate this is duality it's not a dvaita it's not not non duality so what is the problem with all of this and why should we look for anything different something deeper well, the problem started about 2500 years ago with one gentleman called the buddha <laughs> he said that my dear hindus he didn't use the word he there's so many just so many philosophers who were teaching at that so many teachers anatma atma does not exist there is no such thing as a separate independent soul atma which you hindus we are now using the term hindus it was like a general term at that time you all seem to be teaching propounding there's no such thing and he demonstrated logically the untenability of a separate atman not only that why uh, that not only such a thing is not there it would not even help if it was there and he showed the whole of samsara transmigration memory everything becomes possible even without the atman in fact the presence of the atman does not make much of a difference and there were many reasons given to, for this the buddhists who came after uh, uh, the masters who came after the buddha they investigated this and they came up with extraordinary very uh, tight logical arguments to demonstrate uh, to prove that there is no such thing as the a separate 
independent eternal soul you know sort of floating over everything else like a driver within the car um body and mind is the instrument like you we were t- talking like that swami vivekananda also points that out in his practical vedanta lectures there ensued a huge debate between uh, the buddhists and the non buddhist schools on one side the buddhist schools and the hindu schools nayayikas vaisheshikas um sankhya yoga purva mimamsa um the kashmiri shaivas uh, the jainas all of whom talked about um some kind of independent separate reality um, higher the self within and the buddhist said no the buddhist denied the immortal soul atma so beloved to the other other teachers um they denied and as a consequence of that they denied the existence of god also because for example in nyaya philosophy god is just another variety of atma atma is of two kinds self is of two kinds all of us each of us we have an independent self and body mind atma and there's one atma who is separate from all of this and the controller of everything paramatma ishwara god and the buddhists denied this in toto there is no such thing as a separate atma there is no such thing as a separate god of the universe now what happened was it led to a thousand year fight 1000 years of intensive debate the buddhists trying to disprove and the hindus and various other schools trying to prove the existence of atma the benefit of that was um the development the flowering of indian philosophy Uh, i would say indian philosophy has had had two golden ages two wonderful periods of burst of creativity and development one was the nearly 1000 years of um, debate with the buddhists from around um, i would say 200 or 300 years after the buddha the flowering of buddhist philosophy took place to about 800 980 where it began to taper off nearly 1000 years and the second the uh, second uh, time when it developed indian philosophy developed was few hundred years after the disappearance of buddhism advaita vedanta sort of reigned supreme and then other vedanta schools rose dvaita vishishta dvaita they were already there but philosophically they became more sophisticated and mounted several attacks on advaita vedanta leading to an internal fight between different schools of vedanta again a burst of creativity and tremendous development uh, in an indian philosophy in metaphysics in uh, epistemology uh, in language uh, it it concluded with the development of the most sophisticated kind of logical language navya nyaya swami vivekananda says the most sophisticated intricate precise form of logic the world has ever known until i would say the beginning of mathematical logic in the 19th century until that time beginning of symbolic logic until that time the most sophisticated form of log- logic was navyanaya logic of uh, you know Mith- uh, mithila and then uh, nadia navadvip so all that happened one of the courses that i was privileged to do at at uh, in the philosophy department at harvard was taught by professor parimal patel there It's classical indian buddhism 1000 years of buddhist philosophy in sanskrit so in a few months you compress it so that's why harvard is harvard you <laughs> expected to read all these ancient obscure texts translated written maybe 1500 2000 years ago translated into almost incomprehensible english and all of that 1000 years of work <laughs> very subtle work in a matter of a few weeks you're supposed to read it all and understand it <laughs> but it it gave a, a very good bird's eye view a good grasp of the entire what they call, might you might call a literature study of the period of this tremendous clash and the hindu side trying to prove it prove that that um, atma existed led to the uh, great nayayikas like udayana acharya who whose masterful works atma tattva viveka trying to prove the existence of atma against the buddhist attacks even now it is taught in in uh, graduate level courses in india in uh, sanskrit and in philosophy and then nyaya kusumanjali nine proofs nine or 10 proofs of the existence of god again directed against the buddhist critic that god exists trying to prove the existence of god 
So whether they manage to prove the existence of God or manage to prove existence of separate Atma or not is still, it's open. The jury is still out. If you ask the Hindus, yes, Atma and God exists. If you ask the Buddhists, no, we won the debate. There's no Atma, no God. <laughs> Another name which must be mentioned is uh, uh, Kumarila Bhatta to his master works, Shloka Vartika and Tantra Vartika. Uh, which uh, contain repudiations of various schools of Buddhists who tried to, um, uh, who tried to uh, criticize or critique the concept of Atma. The problem is, how can you demonstrate that there is a separate Atma? Where is this Atma? All that we experience is a stream of changes called the body. And if you look within, you will see a stream of changes called the mind. So the Buddhists base their critique on this. The great logician who lived some 500, 600 years before Shankaracharya, uh, Nagarjuna, uh, his book, it, it's an entire book of criticism of concepts like this. Motion, causality, self, even Buddhist concepts of the four, f four noble truths of the Buddha, of Nirvana, all of them are critiqued with razor sharp logic. Even till today, the philosophers and logicians, uh, they find it fascinating, Nagarjuna's logic. And there was further developed by a great master called Chandrakirti, who lived in the great Nalanda, Nalanda University, uh, who lived around 1500 years ago. Uh, one of his famous works is the sevenfold reasoning. Uh, he gives the example of a chariot. Same example, chariot used by Yama to teach Nachiketa about self. You know, Atmanam Ratinam Vidhi. Atma is the passenger. The body is the chariot. The senses are the horses. The mind is the bridle which you hold the, uh, char the horses with. And the charioteer, the, the, the driver, uh, is the intellect. And the goal is enlightenment. So you are like the Atma is like the passenger sitting on the chariot going to the goal of self-realization. What a beautiful idea. And the same chariot was taken up by Chandrakirti. Interestingly, Chandrakirti's chariot does not have a passenger. So there is no Atma there. To show that this concept of an Atma, separate existence of other than body-mind, it's um, null and void, it's empty, uh, shunya. Um, so... I had the opportunity of doing another course by a wonderful professor, Professor Garfield, J. Garfield. He taught Indo-Tibetan Madhyamaka, the philosophy of Nagarjuna Chandrakirti, exported to Tibet and further developed by Tibetan masters. We read, we, to some extent we read Vedanta, to some extent we read Nyaya, even some of the Buddhist masters. But we, as uh, uh, Hindus, as st students of Indian philosophy, often we are ignorant of the further developments which took place in Tibet for a period of more than a thousand years, the lamas sitting on their icy vastness, in the, 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 the mountainous plateau of Tibet, they developed it to a very intricate and subtle level. So we are not even familiar with terms like um, Songkhapa, Mifam and others. So, so this professor taught that to us. I remember the first day in the class when I went in there, the professor said, Swami, keep your Vedanta outside the door. <laughs> he knew I was going to mix it up with Tibetan Buddhism <laughs> and make a mess of it. So he, he was right. You should learn something separately on its own merits and then compare. But interesting, outside the campus, one day I was going back into the, uh, from the Harvard yard and I saw this Lama coming on the other side. And he smiled at me, I smiled at him, and he said, what are you doing here? I said, I am studying your philosophy. <laughs> and I told him about the professor. Uh, he didn't quite approve of the syllabus. He told me some other books to read. And, and then, then he said, but you are, a, you are a Vedanta monk. I said, yes. Oh, a big, broad smile, I still remember. Oh, it is all the same. <laughs> <laughs> How is it all the same? He said, look. There is those five verses on wisdom written by your Shankaracharya. I said, Manisha Panchakam. Yes. He said, I teach Tibetan Buddhism with the help of those five verses. <laughs> and later I found out he was a very eminent teacher. He was the Tibetan Buddhist um, chaplain for Harvard University, Lama Migmar. All right. So what I did was, there's a point to this story. 
Uh, what I did was, at the end of the course, I decided that I am going to counterattack Buddhism from an Advaitic perspective and show how actually Advaita offers a solution for this thousand year debate. Um, and I named the, the, uh, the essay Chandrakirti's Chariot. And I wrote it, refuting it point by point, the uh, Chandrakirti's uh, attack, and submitted it. And the professor, Professor Garfield, immediately returned it and said, What do you think this is? Is it a Vedanta temple talk? <laughs> this is a Harvard University philosophy paper. You have to substantiate every statement with rigorous logic. This won't do. So he put lots of corrections, suggestions. I rewrote the whole thing in a frenzy and sent it back to him. And he sent it back to me again. With, he said, reje again rejected. And the third time I did it, uh, and he, he accepted it. And he said, it's a solid defense of Advaita Vedanta. Uh, and he said, it's you know, uh, of that level which should, can be published in a peer-reviewed journal. And that's what he expected from all the uh, submissions in his course. OK, so that's the background. Um, this thousand year debate, they're saying, where is this other thing called the self, which, which has to be proved? Notice where we were, the consciousness and separate from the entirety of the mind, body, world, Chidananda Rupa Harshivoham. Now the question arises, what is the relationship between consciousness and the objects? You are awareness. Good. Fine. We have, we have come to that. And you are separate from body, mind, object, universe. But you, the consciousness, and all of these things you are separate from, what is the relationship between them? Relationship means, are they um, one and the same? Are they different actually? Is one coming from the other? The other coming from this one? What is the relationship between them? In Indian philosophy, there are many answers to this question. I'll quickly take you through five answers. Consciousness and object. You are awareness and what you are uh, aware of. What is the relationship? At this point, someone might ask, Swami, didn't in the morning, didn't, didn't we make it clear? I am not the body, I am not the mind. Body is changing, I am unchanging. Body is an object, I am the subject. Body is not conscious, I am conscious of the body. So on. So the body, I cannot be the body. The body must be, so I must be something separate from the body. So we made it clear, they're separate. One sadhu in the Himalayas, very nicely, when he's teaching this, he put it so nicely. I'll tell you in Hindi and then I'll explain the point. He said, Mahatma ji, ye to, ye to sach hai ki drashta drishya se alag hai. Lekin ye aapne kabhi socha kya drishya drashta se alag hai? <laughs> it is true that you the witness, you the seer, you the experiencer, you must be separate. I must be separate from the scene. The seer must be separate from the scene. Correct. But have you ever thought of this? That which is seen, drishya, object, is it separate from the seer? Is it separate from the subject? You might say that doesn't make much sense. If one thing is separate from the other, the other must be separate from the first one. If the paper is separate from the desk, then the desk must be separate from the paper. You should be able to see them separately. They are separate. But then that's not always the case. Look at this lectern. There is wood and there's the lectern. The wood is not, not literally the lectern. The wood is separate from the lectern in the sense before the lectern was made, there was the wood. It was a log. Before that, it was a tree. After the... Uh, uh, after the um, see the lectern is broken or something, it will still be wood. So the wood continues. The wood was there before the lectern, during the lectern, now it's there, it's wood. And then afterwards also it will be there. But the lectern doesn't, this podium, this lectern, it does not exist apart from the wood. Wood exists apart from the lectern. This is water and wave. So the water and the, the wave, the water is definitely not the wave, it's separate from the wave, in the sense that it can be water in a glass of water, it can be water in, in the water vapor in the sky, it can be water in a river. It doesn't have to be water in the ocean and the wave. 
but the wave is never separate from the water. You see, whenever the wave exists, it exists as the water, there's nothing else than the water. Take a more subtle example. In our dreams, in our dreams, we see everything in the, in the dream, the mind itself imagines everything in the dream. So everything in the dream is mind. The contents, the mind itself can exist without the dream. When you wake up, you still have a mind, but the dream is not there. But the dream cannot exist without the dreamer's mind. It is you who are imagining it. If you stop imagining it, the dream will disappear. You continue to exist. The dreamer continues to exist. Just no longer dreaming. Drashta drishya se alag hai. Lekin drishya kya drashta se alag hai? It is like to see them separate. It's like somebody has showed you a ray, a array of ornaments and has told you, look, here are necklaces, here are bracelets, here are um, tiaras. And there is something called gold, which is the reality. Now if I say, okay, so necklaces, bracelets, tiaras, and gold. Let me look for gold. And you look at, throw away the ornaments, I'm going to, I, where are you going in search of reality? Gold. You'll never find it. Somebody shows you an array of pottery and says, here is pottery, uh, but the reality is clay. And says, okay, throw the pots away, I'm going to look for the reality called clay. You'll never find it. Because it's right there. It, that, that which you see, the reality is separate from that, but those things are not separate from the reality. You can find the reality there and there itself. Swami Vivekananda says powerfully, He who runs away to meditate and die in a Himalayan cave has missed the way. He who plunges into the vanities of life has missed the way. But then what is the way? You either run away from everything in life, become a monk, stay and meditate in the mountains and attain enlightenment, if that is missing the way, or then you plunge into life, do whatever everybody else is doing, but that's also missing the way. Then these are the only two options. He says, no, the way is to divinize life itself, is to deify life itself, it's to see God in everything in, uh, around you, in the people around you, in the actions around you, in life itself, everywhere there is God, that is the way. And the divinity within everything. So this one divinity pervading everything, that is what Advaita wants to say. Not that there is a separate divinity and a separate universe. This relationship between consciousness and the object. Let me give you five quick approaches which we find in Indian philosophy. Five, just very big. I know there are masters of Indian philosophy here, some of the leading uh, teachers in the world. So this is very crude. This is a very um, uh, bird's eye, sweeping view. One is consciousness and matter. One is that um, consciousness originates from matter. The subject originates from the object. Who says this? It is the, athe uh, the materialist. From matter, from a living body, from a living brain, somehow consciousness is born. So reality is matter. Reality is time, space, energy, matter. And then um, organic matter, then living bodies, then the uh, nervous systems and brains, and then only consciousness comes. It's a byproduct. So that is reductionist science. That is the ancient charvakas. They will say consciousness is produced. They give an example. Pan. Now only those who have from India and have eaten pan in the traditional way, they will understand what I mean. Pan uh, and all the ingredients, there's nothing, uh, you know, stark red in them. But when you chew it, your tongue and your <laughs> lips become red. So he says, there is nothing called consciousness in matter, the charvakas say. But when it's mixed in the unique way in the living body, matter, uh, consciousness originates somehow, like the color red. And although our science has advanced enormously in principle from a philosophical perspective, not one inch more. I have had exactly this statement told to me by um, a philosopher and scientist in uh, City University, New York. He said, Swami, and there was a debate about consciousness. He said, Swami, I am convinced that consciousness is the product of a living brain. How? He says, look, how? We don't know yet. But um, give us 30, 40 years. This is called promissory materialism. I promise to give you the solution in 30, 40 years. And it's a serious uh, answer because his, his uh, example he gave was 
look, 100 years back, people said we will never understand the mystery of life. What is life? We don't know. It is something spiritual. But now, we understand what is life down to the molecular level. Similarly, right now we can't actually explain how little electrical activity in the brain is producing consciousness. How? But I'm sure it is. Clearly there's a correlation. There's also, he says, there's a product cause and effect relationship which I want to show. But we can't show yet. So just like life we can demonstrate it is made of um, molecular processes. Similarly, consciousness is also made of uh, processes in the neurons. But we will show it will take 40, 50, 100 years promissory materialism. So that's one. Why that is wrong, uh, I will tell you later, when we get into Vedanta itself, that in principle it's wrong. Uh, so there's David Chalmers, who is uh, uh, a professor of philosophy, mind and philosophy, uh, mind, brain and uh, consciousness in um, NYU. And he calls it the hard problem of consciousness, that you cannot uh, generate a subjective experience from purely objective processes. Uh, that's the hard problem. But why exactly? And Vedanta gives us a very clear reason why. Anyway, so that's one. Uh, consciousness is a product of matter. The opposite is a second view. Matter is a product of consciousness. Who says this? All the theistic religions of the world, if you think of it, what is the common idea of God in all the theistic religions of the world, the God-believing religions in the world? What, what do Christians and Jews and Muslims and Vaishnavas and Shaktas and uh, Shaivas, what do they believe about God? That God is a conscious being. Do you, if you ask, is your God conscious or unconscious? Of course God is conscious. God is an intelligent, conscious being. And so conscious being is the creator of the universe? Yes. So matter, uh, object, is created by consciousness. How? Again, that's a whole question. But uh, that is the second view. We're talking about the views of consciousness and, and matter, subject and object. Third view, neither is created by the other. They are fundamental eternal realities. They exist parallelly and interact with each other. Who says this? 5,000 years ago, the oldest philosopher known to humanity, Kapila, Sankhya, the founder of the Sankhya system, he said this, ultimately you can resolve everything into consciousness and nature. Prakriti, Purusha. Purusha means consciousness and Prakriti means the rest of it, nature. Basically, that's the conclusion we arrived at in the morning. Consciousness and everything else. And they interact. 5,000 years ago, and here, 21st century, in, um, in uh, New York, uh, same David Chalmers, he is uh, propounding a theory called panpsychism. It's not a new theory, it's been there for a long time, but now a fresh new life has come into it, which is saying that we cannot reduce consciousness to matter, we cannot reduce consciousness to the brain, so consciousness must be a fundamental reality. There's a fundamental reality called consciousness, and there are other fundamental realities called time, space, matter, energy, and they, and they interact and they exist. And consciousness is everywhere, ubiquitous consciousness. I was thinking exactly the same thing that Sankhya, uh, Sankhya philosophers have been saying for 5,000 years, literally. I, I remember I had this conversation with Deepak Chopra. You've heard of Deepak Chopra? Yeah. So he said in the green room before the conversation, before the dialogue, he said, uh, Swamiji, they are taking our theories and not giving credit to us. This uh, hard problem of consciousness, the consciousness is everywhere. I said, Deepak ji, it's good if they do that because if you say today that, oh, I learned this from Vedanta or Buddhism and I'm uh, saying this, it will be discredited. But if you say, I'm an atheist, I'm a materialist, and I cannot explain consciousness that way. That's, that's why I must say, I'm saying that consciousness must be a fundamental reality. It cannot be explained in material terms. That's much more powerful, and we should be happy. What you came at thousands of years ago, that is now being validated and coming at it from a different perspective and independently, and that's good. That's really good. So uh, consciousness is produced, um, matter is produced by consciousness, then consciousness and matter are, are uh, parallel realities, whether it is the ancient Sankhya or the more modern panpsychist today is saying that. The fourth view is the view of Nagarjuna, Chandrakirti, the emptiness view. They say neither matter produced consciousness nor consciousness produced matter. Um, in fact, nobody produced each other. Nothing has been produced at all. What do you mean? 
It's all empty, sarvam shunyam. Now, Chandrakirti uses a very interesting example. Two bales or sheaves of hay leaning against each other. Consciousness, matter. Consciousness, subject and object. It's only when you're conscious, you're conscious of the world. There's something out there. But only when you're conscious of the world are you aware that you are aware. The subject arises with the help of the object all the time. Which shows one depends on the other. Which shows neither is independently real. When there is no object, there is no subject. And Swami, didn't you talk about light in the blackness of space, uh, consciousness in, uh, in deep sleep, object has gone, only consciousness exists. So the emptiness people, Chandrakirti and all will say, all that is back calculation, you know. Back calculation is you have made up your mind that consciousness exists et uh, eternally. And now when it, you are in trouble, in deep sleep, for example, no consciousness. In coma, it seems no consciousness. You are somehow introducing it. This is like accountant. <laughs> you know, there, there's a funny story about different people who applied for a job. And uh, when they, they were being interviewed, uh, there was the uh, engineer who was asked, what is 2 plus 2? So the engineer calculated and calculated and calculated. He said something between 3.9 and 4.1. <laughs> and I don't remember. It's very funny. Each, each person giving an answer from their, their, their academic discipline. Finally, the, academic, uh, the accountant comes. Uh, what is 2 plus 2? He gets up and he closes the door and he comes and whispers, How much do you want it to be, sir? <laughs> This guy can get a job in Wall Street, you know. <laughs> How much do you want it to be? So you Advaitins, non dualists are doing exactly the same thing. You have made up your mind that you want it to be consciousness. I mean, clearly there is no consciousness, you are bringing in, smuggling in consciousness. That it, it is like light and darkness of space. What proof is there? There is no consciousness there. Or at least what we normally ca call consciousness. Right now, that kind of consciousness is not there, you must admit that. So, emptiness. Consciousness also empty, object also empty. Subject and object both are empty, sarvam shunyam. Then what is real? Won't say. And, and there is a point to that, why the Tibetan Buddhist won't say. There's a very logical point to that. And that's why the Lama said, it is ultimately the same thing. But there's something coming at it from a negative side, something coming at it from a positive side. And both ultimately pointing to the same thing. Then the fifth approach. What are the four, four approaches in case you have forgotten? The, uh, matter produces consciousness, eight, uh, materialists. Uh, consciousness produces matter, religious people. Uh, then uh, consciousness matter parallel, uh, Sankhyans and Patanjali Yoga uh, and the modern panpsychist. Then both are empty, the, um, the Shunyavadi Buddhist. Then the, what, the point I'm coming to, Advaita Vedanta, which says consciousness only. What we call matter, what we call object, is an appearance in consciousness, much like a wave appears in water, much like um, uh, objects in the dream appear in your dreaming mind. It's not produced. So isn't it like God producing the world? It's not produced. Nothing has actually happened. You have not actually produced a world. When it seems to be a world, it continues to be consciousness. It was God and Brahman, and now it is a miserable world. And one day it will be all right. Gaudapada condemns this view. Pragutpatte rajam sarvam. He says, before the origination of the universe, everything was perfect. Not on the one uh, existence absolute. Now it has not there. Now it has, universe has become. Uh, we have come and we have to find our way back to Brahman. And it will happen someday or the other. Uh, he says, fools. You will never attain to realization in this way. That same Brahman continues to exist right now without any change at all. And you are that, that Brahman. Uh, so consciousness is the reality in which matter appears. So everything that appears right now, whatever you are experiencing as a world, is nothing other than consciousness. It is not that everything is consciousness. It is nothing other than consciousness. Consciousness alone is and the, here I'm using consciousness in the sense of pure consciousness, sat, chit. That alone is, Brahman alone is the world, and it, it appears as the world. Brahma, satyam, jagat, mithya. This is the conclusion of Advaita Vedanta. Not what it seemed in the morning. World 
and I, the consciousness world, body, mind, and I am consciousness. Not like that. Consciousness in which mind appears, body appears, world appears, waking, dreaming, deep sleep appear and disappear, one consciousness alone. How do you do this? Again, we'll dive into a quick survey of uh, various schools of Indian philosophy coming to this conclusion. See, I found this. This you can find in many ways. It can be done in many ways. Uh, let me just give you one thing which I found quite impressive. The present Shankaracharya of Puri, Nishchalananda Saraswati Ji, in uh, one of his talks, in one sentence he said something. How from the world you go to pure consciousness? Just by analysis. And that happens in seven stages. Uh, just a sentence, a fragment of a sentence. Now to explain the fragment of a sentence, you need a full talk, which is what this is, today's talk, this one. What did he say? I'm going to, we're going to walk through it. What are we going to achieve? We start with this world as you see it in common sense. Here I am, here is the, this world. And right here, we will end up with consciousness only. With this world, with eyes open, only consciousness is the reality. We will we'll come to understand this. And this happens in seven stages. What are the seven stages? Very quickly, let me just go through what he said. First, you start with Jagat, world. What world? As you explain, as you see it right now. People and, uh, you know, space and uh, buildings and chairs and tables and um, body, mind, all of this is world. Next, stage two. You analyze this into the five elements. He says, Jagat, second stage is, deeper you go into it, you will see Pancha Bhuta Vilasa, the play of five elements. The old cosmology, space, air, fire, water, earth. You might think, oh, that's all that was very old and outdated. Although it was at one time prevalent across the world, in the east and in the west, everywhere, four elements sometimes, five elements sometimes, three elements sometimes, but basically that. And there is a very interesting psychology behind all of that. But anyway, whether you consider that or the um, hundred plus elements of the periodic table, it is uh, basically the world is made of matter, energy, time, space. And at this point, no scientist will dispute it. So basically, this is what it is. All of this is matter, energy, time, space and all. Pancha Bhuta Vilasa, the play of five elements. Our bodies are that. And if you read Vedanta, Sankhya, you will see even our minds are made of the subtle forms of these five elements. Here is where um, I would say ancient Indian philosophy is a step ahead of modern science. And what, what I'm, by that what I mean is, forget consciousness. What is mind? There is no explanation, no place for something like mind in modern physics. People don't know. It's, it's like uh, a standing scandal of, uh, of our modern understanding of the world. We, so why? Science, psychology is a science. Yes, but what does psychology study? When you say study the mind, they are very uneasy about studying the mind because where is the mind? I am feeling the mind. Yes, you are feeling it. But for a scientist, the last thing that a scientist can see is tiny electrical activity in your brain revealed by fMRI scans and all. That's it. Your thoughts, your emotions, your ideas, your memories. Where, what is it? Nobody knows. Nobody knows how to fit it into a modern reductionist, uh, you know, matter energy scheme, paradigm of the world. So mind, even according to uh, Indian cosmology, mind is also matter actually. There, India, in Indian thought has no problem at all. It is the subtle forms of the five elements which comprises the mind. Mind is also matter. Um, the old ridiculous joke. You know, in philosophy classes, they'll always tell you. It's the first joke you hear. Um, what is matter? No, matter and mind. What is matter? Never mind. <laughs> what is mind? No matter. <laughs> the play of five elements. Then third stage, it is nothing but, all of it is nothing but maya, maya vilasa. It is the play of maya. At this point, somebody will say, oh, how do you know that? You have now introduced some old theology that is, sub, you know, in India, everybody knows, sub maya hai. <laughs> Jagat, the world, the world is the play of five elements or matter, time, energy, the time, space, matter, energy. All of it is maya. How do you know? But actually, I was just thinking, if you contemplate the, the cutting edge discoveries of modern science in the 20th century till today, 
You notice the, the, the all-pervasive presence of paradox everywhere. Now, Rebecca Goldstein, who wrote a book on Godel, in her introduction to that book, she says that, um, notice the greatest discoveries of 20th century in science. Einstein's relativity, theory of relativity, Heisenberg's you know, the uncertainty principle, and Godel's incompleteness, theorems of incomplete, incompleteness theorems. But just look at the names, relativity, uh, uncertainty, incompleteness. What's so strange about that? If you're in 19th century, if you asked scientists or mathematicians, what do you expect knowledge to be in 50 years, 100 years? They would not have said relativity. They would have said absolute um, truth. We are looking for absolute truth. They would not have said uh, uncertainty. They would have said certainty. They would not have said incompleteness. In fact, in, there was one mathematician, David Hilbert, I think. He had a whole program, completeness of mathematics, how to complete the system of mathematics. And Godel came and ruined that by showing incompleteness. But in principle, they did not expect knowledge to be uh, relative and uncertain and incomplete. And so that's what she has written. Uh, I, the first thing that struck me is incompleteness, relativity, uncertainty, this is Maya. This is how Maya is, uh, is uh, described. If you, if you push any system of knowledge far enough, you're going to end up with inconsistencies, you're going to end up with paradoxes. In the new school in Manhattan, I remember three or three, four years ago, there was a very nice conference. And the conference was uh, on the unknown, unknowability, on what is unknowable in every discipline. So there, it was, there, was, there were physicists, leading physicists, leading mathematicians, and there were historians and people from literature uh, coming and talking about unknowability in their own fields. And I remember, quite, we, we know what the mathematician or the physicist will say, historian, the historian I still remember, the British gentleman who said, in history we know that the future is fixed, the past is always changing. <laughs> As you know more and more about history, you keep changing your theories about what might have happened in the past. Unknowability. So Maya Vilasa, it is the appearance of Maya. It, Maya itself, see it's not so strange. The philosopher Galen Strawson, whom his father was a very noted philosopher in Oxford University, Peter Strawson. He, Galen Strawson teaches, or used to teach in Texas, UT uh, Austin. He had, had written this half humorous, half serious uh, article in New York Times uh, called The Hard Problem of Matter. He said, consciousness is not a problem, he said. We are all conscious. We are aware of consciousness directly. But after consciousness comes matter. We are aware of matter. Now, what is matter is the real question. We are all directly conscious. We are aware of ourselves. We are conscious. Then what comes in consciousness is the object. What is that object? What is matter? That is the question. And as we investigate matter more and more, it is disappearing before our very eyes. Is the Matter is a paradox. So, the um, Maya Vilas, that the play of matter, it's a paradox actually at, at its root. So Maya Vilasa. But in Vedanta, Maya is the power of Brahman, the power of consciousness. So Maya Vilasa reduces to the play of consciousness, Chid Vilasa. It's consciousness by its unique power which is manifesting as the elements and which is manifesting as this universe. Chid Vilasa, the play of consciousness. Now at this level, there is a vast, vast philosophy. This is called Kashmir Shaivism. Kashmir Shaivism says this universe is a play of consciousness. It's the play of Shiva. So, Shiva is consciousness, the play of consciousness. So, you are consciousness. It's your play. And I love that story by uh, Alan Watts, uh, where he talks about what is going on here. And it's a beautiful story. It's a story for little children, but it's actually very profound for, I think, for grown up people. Alan Watts, I, of course, is long before my time, but some of you might have uh, heard about him. Uh, he was in the Bay Area. And, and an article about him described him as, as, a, as a strange combination of philosopher and pirate. <laughs> so he taught a mixture of Buddhism and Vedanta. But the story, uh, it, it perfectly matches Kashmiri Shaivism. So 
the story goes, God existed for, from eternity to eternity. But then existing like that for eternity, nobody else was there, God got bored and thought, I want to play. But whom will God play with? There's nobody to play with. Only God exists. So he thought about it for a very long time. How can I play? I don't have a friend. Then he hit upon an idea because he is extraordinarily clever. He's God. So he hit upon an idea and he pretended to be not God. So God pretending to be not God. Now God can play. This is God and God pretending to be not God. Now there are two. God can play. But the problem is God is very good at what he does. So when he pretended to be not God, God he pretended so, so well he forgot that he was God. And that is what is going on now. God, who's pretending to be not God, forgotten that he's God, is searching for God. This is samsara. <laughs> <laughs> that is a beautiful description of Kashmiri Shaivism. Shiva and Jiva are the same. Shiva manifests, plays as this universe and enters into this universe as Jiva. And contracts his own powers and glories into a smaller form, in the contracted form, it's jiva. Sri Ramakrishna used to say, Pash baddho jiva, Pash mukto shiv. This idea of pasha, of tying oneself, yeah. you become jiva. Freed from that, you are shiva. Kashmiri Shaivas have an extraordinary idea of bondage and liberation. He said, you are not bound. He says, Advaitins, Vedantins are wrong. You are not bound. You are free. You are shiva. How can shiva be bound? You are playing. You want to play at being a miserable human being. So you're playing. <laughs> the day you want to be liberated, who can stop you? You're Shiva. That day, that instant you'll be liberated. You might say, but I want to be liberated. That's why I'm practicing all spiritual disciplines. It's not happening. It's taking such a long time. Then the Kashmiri Shaivas will say, now you are Shiva. You want to play at trying to be liberated. You're trying to be a sadhaka now. You're playing at being a sadhaka. The day you decided I'm liberated, you'll be liberated. Anyway, so that's their view. It's the play of consciousness. Very beautiful view. Uh, Leela, the play of consciousness. Somebody asked Sri Ramakrishna, why is there so much suffering? You find it in the gospel of Sri Ramakrishna. If God exists, so much suffering in our lives and in the world today, uh, whether you see the you know, shooting of uh, little children, uh, war, um, COVID, some are natural causes, some are man-made causes. Why is there so much suffering? If God is the controller of human being and of nature, why is there suffering anywhere at all? So Sri Ramakrishna gave three levels of answers. The first answer was, it's a mystery, it's a paradox. Can we understand the, um, the uh, will of God? It is beyond our understanding. What is that? Maya vilasa. It is the Maya of the Lord. It's paradoxical. We cannot understand. The gentleman who asked the question was not satisfied by this. Again he asked, no, 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 no. This is not, uh, not an answer. Why is there suffering? The second answer Sri Ramakrishna gave was, this is the Leela of God, the play of God. What can we do? It is the play of God. Chid vilasa. Yeah, the play of consciousness. Second answer. Same question. Why is there suffering? That also the gentleman became furious. He said, in Bengali, he said, Tar to lila ramra mori. It's the play of God, but it's killing us. It's veritably death for us. We suffer terribly. What kind of play is this? Would you tolerate this answer from anyone in the world? Uh, say, for example, uh, the neighboring kid, uh, he plays ball and he hits a ball and smashes your light, you know, out, outside your door. And you catch hold of the little kid and said, uh, why did you do it? And he says, it is my Leela. <laughs> <laughs> will you be impressed or you will not be impressed? <laughs> yeah. So why would you be impressed with God? This whole universe is my Leela, play of uh, consciousness. And then Sri Ramakrishna gave the third answer to which there is no comeback, which is actually the Advaitic answer. He said, it is God's Leela. What kind of answer is that? It's death for us. It's death for us, just for me. And Sri Ramakrishna says, and who are you? Do you know who you are? You don't know actually. I am suffering, but who am I? That I don't know. And that is the Advaitic. He point, is pointing towards the Advaitic answer. There is no answer to that. <laughs> uh, so that we will come. But now we are at Chid Vilasa, the play of consciousness. This whole universe is a play of consciousness. But then, Advaitins being strict log logicians, they will ask, 
can consciousness play? Uh, playing means change. Playing also implies a kind of desire, you know, that I want to play. So is change, desire, it might be a good um, metaphor, but literally does consciousness play? Does it change? There are deep philosophical problems also. Something that is subject to change will be subject to death also, subject to destruction also. Then consciousness can end. Not only that, consciousness is that which reveals everything as an object. If consciousness is playing, uh, then it is play. Consciousness is that which reveals the play. In that case, consciousness must be uh, separate from that play. So, there are problems with this. And Kashmiri Shaivism, an extraordinary system, especially in spiritual practice. Those are spiritual practitioners. There are so many things to learn from Kashmiri Shaivism. It's a very sophisticated, very um, uh, intricate philosophy. But I must say, from an Advaitic perspective, and from the perspective of the other older philosophies of India, whether Buddhistic, Advaitic, you'll notice they really haven't engaged with Kashmiri Shaivism. Where is the vast literature? The great Abhinava Gupta and others, they engage with every system of philosophy. But those systems of philosophy, they mention it in passing and they refute it and go ahead because there are, I will not go into it, but there are deep fundamental flaws at the very conception, at, at the very root. It is maybe more poetry than philosophy at some level. I know there are those who would be aghast at, <laughs> I'm thinking of uh, certain philosophers. Anyway, uh, but can consciousness play? No, consciousness does not change. To actually, literally, if you mean physically actually play, I mean physically the word doesn't apply to consciousness anyway. So play is not possible. What happens is, what ex ex exactly happens in consciousness? Things appear in consciousness. Consciousness experiences. The very nature of consciousness is to experience uh, appearances. So the universe appears in consciousness. That appearance theory is called vivarta, chid vivarta. It's not chin... Chid Vilasa, not the play of consciousness, but an appearance of consciousness. So everything appears because of consciousness. The very nature of consciousness. What do you mean appearance of consciousness? Um, one Swami explained it very nicely. He said, the nature of the eye is to see, and the nature of space is to remain unseen. And that's the Nyaya theory, that space is not seen. So the eye sees and the space remains unseen, but the nature, I will see. And space cannot be seen. So when you look up at the space, it looks like an inverted bowl. It looks like a surface. Children might think that it's a blue inverted bowl. They don't get the feeling that it's endless space there. Why? Because the eye has a way of imagining a surface which has to be seen. And space cannot be seen. It's like that old question of irresistible force meets immovable object. What will happen? Um, there's a story, you know, the, one of the, my favorite authors, science fiction authors, was Isaac Asimov. Though you must, some of you must have read. And uh, he tells a story about his life. He said he would ask this question to any girl who is a prospect of marrying, that uh, uh, if you answer this question, then I will marry you. What will uh, happen if a, an immovable force meets an irresistible object? What is an immovable force? That uh, immo immovable object that which cannot be moved. Irresistible force, that which can move everything. It can't be resisted. So if the two move, the two meet, what will happen? Nobody could answer. I think nobody wanted to marry him also. <laughs> <laughs> then, the girl whom he finally married, she answered correctly. So what was the answer? It will never happen because if there is an immovable um, object, there cannot be an irresistible force. By definition, immovable object means there cannot be any force which can be, uh, cannot be resisted. And if there is an irresistible force, there can be no object which cannot be moved. So the two can never meet. So then he had to marry her. Then, so. <laughs> but here, the result is paradox. Consciousness will experience and there is nothing else other than consciousness to experience, so consciousness appears as its own object. Consciousness appears as its own object, a very much like a dream. In a dream, the mind appears as the dream world. It is called chid vivarta, not an actual transformation of consciousness, not that consciousness becomes the universe, not that consciousness produces matter, energy, time, space, but it appears as matter, energy, time, space, like a virtual world. Now, um, this might not be as crazy as it sounds. 
There are crazier ideas out there in modern physics. Uh, uh, Brian Greene, who's a very well-known cosmologist at Columbia, he's written this book, An Elegant Universe, and the PBS documentary also was there on string theory and everything. Uh, he, his latest book, uh, Until the End of Time, it is more philosophy than uh, physics. So he's, he has written this book, he launched it at Harvard, and there, a beautiful presentation. Uh, one of the things he mentioned was, the universe might be a product of a brain, they called it a Boltzmann brain, and uh, like, a quantum state existing for endless amounts of time, it can come together into an intelligence suddenly of uh, immeasurable capacity and produce a universe. I mentioned it to an, an eminent philosopher. He was so furious, he said, yes, once you're an eminent uh, physicist and scientist, you can say anything you like, and that will be taken <laughs> seriously. Whereas philosophers, we say some of the most logical things, but because we're a philosopher, nobody cares for us. <laughs> Anyway, chid vivartha, it appears as consciousness. Uh, 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 the consciousness appears as the uh, universe. But that which appears as the universe, in that case, every bit of it must be consciousness. If consciousness is appearing as the universe, then the next stage is called chin maya, pervaded by consciousness. So every, if consciousness itself, if the wood itself is coming as the table, then every bit of this must be wood. Inside, outside, top, bottom, it must be wood. If consciousness itself is appearing as the universe, then every bit of that appearance must be consciousness. Uh, so if you examine everything, everything is consciousness. Chinmaya, pervaded by consciousness. You might think this must be the last stage. No, one more stage. <laughs> Chinmaya, pervaded by consciousness. Is there a pervader and pervaded relationship? Is it something like, here is a room. Switch on the light, the light will pervade the room. Is it like that? There is a universe. And switch on consciousness. Consciousness pervades. Uh, there is a room. Light the incense. The fragrance of the incense will pervade the room. Is it like that? Or is it like wood and the lectern? Like wave and water? Like gold and ornament? Uh, here, light and the room are distinct. One pervades the other. L uh, room and the uh, incense fragrance are distinct. One pervades the other. Is consciousness like that? It pervades the universe? Well, many people think like that that there is the universe, solid, here, and God is pervading the universe, consciousness is pervading the universe, something is there like light or something like that all everywhere. And here Vivekananda said that I have never taught such strange doctrine that uh, God is everything. Mary Hill said, I understood what you have taught, that God is everything. Vivekananda said, I have never taught such a thing. I have never taught such a thing. You said it. No, what I meant was that God alone is. The universe is not, the world is not. Everything is not, God alone is. And God alone is, everything is not. The last stage is, it's not that consciousness pervades the universe. Consciousness alone is. Yeah. Universe is an appearance, consciousness alone is. Chin matra, consciousness alone. Not a pervading consciousness. Shankaracharya also says in one place, there is no pervader-pervaded relationship. Here also, there is no pervader-pervaded relationship. It is wood, through and through. It has a form of a lectern, name of a lectern, and the use of a lectern. Nama, rupa, vyavahara. Name, form, and use. Name, form, and transaction. But the reality is that it is made of wood only. There is only wood. Consciousness only, chin matra. Now, seven stages. Let me run you through the seven stages and bring this to a conclusion. Seven stages. Start with the physical world. Uh, start with the physical world, Jagat, stage one. Resolve that in your understanding into matter, space, time, energy, into the five elements. Pancha um, Bhuta Vilasa. Resolve that further. They are all produced from uh, Maya, Maya Vilasa. Of course, the Shankaracharya, when he said this, in his mind there was Taittiriya Upanishad. Tasmad vai, tasmad atmana, akasha sambhuta. From this atma appears akasha, vayu, agni, uh, uh, sky, air, fire, water. So maya vilasa. It is all the play of maya. But maya is the power of consciousness. Maya does not exist by itself. Maya is the power of consciousness. So next, stage four, chid vilasa. The play of consciousness. Whole of Kashmiri Shaivism will enter here. Extraordinary philosophy. But we have objection. 
does consciousness actually play? Because Kashmiri Shaivas, they will say that there is a dynamic aspect to consciousness. Consciousness vibrates, spanda. Consciousness, does it actually change? Does it vibrate? Does it play? No. Things appear in consciousness, as our own experience of consciousness. So, chid uh, vivarta, appearance theory. Then the sixth stage is, whatever is an appearance in consciousness must be pervaded by consciousness. Every bit of it must be consciousness. It's an appearance. So, chin maya, pervaded by consciousness. And the last one is, chin matra. It's not pervader and pervaded, it is consciousness and consciousness alone. Shankaracharya in Aparokshanabhuti, he says, Kadye hi karanam pashyet. In the effect, notice the cause. In the lectern, notice the wood. In the clay pot, notice the clay. The clay is the cause. The pot is the effect. Oh, where is the clay? In the pot? Well, you are t- what you are touching, that's the clay. Inside it's the clay. The top is the clay. The bottom is the clay. In fact, through and through you find clay alone. So you, you next no, notice that the cause, the material cause, the substance pervades the effect through and through. What we just did. Jin matra, consciousness alone. So it is clay through and through. In that case, there is no separate reality called pot. So there is no separate reality called pot which has been produced. So if the effect has not been produced, then how how will you call clay the cause? The cause loses its causality. Karanata tato gachet. He says then, the cause loses its causality. Clay cannot be called the cause of pot because clay alone exists in a clay pot. A pot is an appearance, is a form, is a name and a an use. You can, it looks like this. You call it a pot and you can put water in it. it will, everything will work, but it is clay and clay alone. What remains when you do this analysis? It's a clay remains, yes, but the clay remains in the example. They are not interested in pots and clay. Uh, he says, the muni alone remains. You, the sage, you remain alone. Uh, you, consciousness. You remain alone. In you, this entire universe is an appearance, not one bit different from you. You pervade this entire universe uh, as awareness, as consciousness. There's this oneness of all existence, that right now, just as all ornaments are gold, all waves and foam and uh, surf are water, and all pottery, clay pots, are nothing but clay, Similarly, this entire universe is nothing but Brahman, Atman, consciousness appearing as this universe. This is the answer to Chandrakirti and Nagarjuna and to the Buddha. You are right, there is no separate Atma, body, mind, Atma. No. It is the Atma alone appearing as body, mind and universe. It is Brahman alone appearing as body, mind and universe. Um, Swami Vivekananda says, Advaita alone gives a solution to this problem. It is that, not that there is a separate rope and a snake. It is the rope alone which appears as the snake. That in which our present experience we see as world, body, mind. And when we get an insight by inquiry, by samadhi, by the grace of God. Remember the paths I talked about, path of devotion, path of meditation, path of inquiry. In whichever way, once we get that insight, we see uh, it is consciousness alone which appears as everything. Only, we'll say it's consciousness alone, I alone. Brahme Vedam Sarvam, Ahame Vedam Sarvam. Brahman alone is all this. I alone am all this. I means consciousness. The jnani will say that. The uh, devotee will say, God alone is everything. Everything God has is appearing as this entire universe. So this is the oneness of all existence. Um, which, just as a side note, if you go to the uh, Buddhist approach, especially the Tibetan Buddhist approach. And of course, there is a Chinese Buddhist approach. I have been told that's even closer to Vedanta. Uh, but I am not aware. I have not read much about, not at all, in fact. Uh, but the Tibetan Buddhist approach, it seems to be entirely negative, but it leaves you pointed at something. And uh, there are schools, apart from the most well-known school of Tibetan Buddhism, which is the Gelug school, the most powerful, influential. But there are schools like the Jonang school, the Shentong school, which openly speak about Buddha nature as the basic space of awareness. Basic space of awareness, if you translate, Chidakasha, consciousness itself. 
they will not directly say because there is a reason. If you positively state something, you will attract the, the anger of Chandrakirti and Nagarjuna and they will prove that it is empty. But, and it's true, it's not a positively stated entity. It is the reality of all so-called positive and negative entities. So this basic space of awareness uh, of the Buddhists, uh, the Mahayana Buddhists, and the pure consciousness of the Advaitins, and if you make it a little more liberal, Sri Ramakrishna's approach was liberal in the sense that all these are logical niceties. The fact is, everybody has got it right. I met one Swami, an American Swami, uh, in our order. I asked him, how did you become a monk? He said, I grew up in, um, in Carolina, in, uh, North Carolina, I think, and it was staunchly Christian. And then I no noticed that every church was saying that Every other church, people will go to hell. Uh, we are right. And the church across the uh, street, they're all going to go to hell. So I, as a teenager, I thought they're all wrong then. But then later I came across a book, Vedanta for the Western World. And there, I, immediately I saw, I connected with it. It said, everybody is right. Not that every little detail is right. But in principle, everybody is right. The whole idea of the perennial philosophy, that underlying all the var varied approaches, uh, in religion, in philosophy, in spirituality, there's one grand underlying truth, uh, a perennial truth, which can be accessed by uh, spiritual practices and which will give you what we are all looking for, ultimate fulfillment and transcendence of suffering. Atyantika dukkhan vritti paramananda praptishya. Today I pray to Thakur, Ma and Swamiji, this auspicious day, the Silver Jubilee here, the 125th, anniversary of the Ramakrishna mission to bless all of us that that great consummation may come in this life for all of us maybe by the grace of God may we realize the, the ultimate reality our real nature the real nature of this universe Om Shanti 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 Hari Om Tat Sat Shri Ramakrishna Rupanamastu. This is a, a question about enlightenment, you know. I was just looking. Why don't we ever see examples of people who got enlightenment through sadhana in this life? That would be more encouraging for those on this path. So how do we know that you have not seen or people, such people are not seen? There are. You can see uh, here and um, throughout, especially in India. There's an interesting story about Swami Vivekananda. He's giving talks in this country. And this lady, who was a young girl at that time, that, um, Vivekananda had come to our city to give a talk, and he came into our church to give a talk. Um, so as he walked in, one of my friends, another young girl, she said excitedly, he's like a prophet of the Old Testament. And I said, but I thought that the age of the prophets is past. And then she said, oh, don't you know, in India, it's always the age of the prophets. <laughs> so there have been enlightened people, I firmly believe, I have seen a few maybe. Um, and there have been, are they going to be? So this um, reminded me of a question that my philosophy professor at uh, Harvard asked. That Swami, so few, again, we were discussing Buddhism, it applies to Vedanta also. How many attain nirvana? How many attain enlightenment? Very, very few. So why should anybody go into a path where there is very little chance of success? <laughs> Tell me. So I gave him two answers, and he gave me a, a third answer. All those three answers I'll give you. Very beautiful, third answer especially. So the two answers which I gave him was, first of all, it's not that there's a very small chance of success. There's a 100% chance of success. Uh, uh, in this path, because you are Brahman, you are that absolute reality, what can keep you away from it? Kashmiri Shaivism, you are Shiva. What can keep you away from your real nature? If you, this one thing that is guaranteed, whether you'll be a billionaire or not in this life or in some life, whether you'll win the Nobel Prize or not in this life or some life, who knows? But will you be enlightened in this life or some life? Guaranteed, 100%. The yeah. highest goal in life we will get. And this is, I'm not making it up. Arjuna asked this question to Krishna in the sixth chapter. Suppose I don't attain enlightenment in this life. 
then is everything lost? I practice spirituality. I did not commit fully to, you know, just pursue a worldly life. So both ways am I a loser? Uh, then Sri Krishna says, no. On this path, nobody ever loses. Nobody comes to a bad end. Nahi kalyana krittata durgatim kaschit gachati. Never comes to a bad end on this path. Every other path you will lose what you have got. Not in this path. Once you start on the path of devotion, of knowledge, of yoga, of enlightenment, spirituality, whatever your path, you will attain. And whatever progress you have made will not be lost. Not only you will attain ultimately, not, it will not be lost. You will pick up from whatever you have attained in this life. Not that you will remember everything. Oh, I attained a few, I memorized 100 shlokas. So will I start with the 101st shloka of Gita next life? No. Particular memories may be lost. But the tendencies gathered, the samskaras gathered in this life will power you. And we see that. We see that. The power of samskaras. That is first answer. The second answer is, first answer to, why should one enter this path? Yes, success is guaranteed. But we just don't know when. Sri Ramakrishna says in the city of Banaras, it's the city of Mother Annapurna. So everybody will be fed. Everybody gets food there. But he says some will get it in the morning, some will be fed in the afternoon, some in the late, late afternoon, some at sunset, at, you know, when evening comes. But nobody will go hungry. That sounds encouraging. But remember, morning, afternoon and sunset of God are very different from... <laughs> the sunset of God means the end of the universe, of this cycle. <laughs> billions and billions of years, thousands of lifetimes hence for us. That I read this joke in Reader's Digest long ago. One man, uh, you know, he prayed and prayed and God appeared before him. And God said, what do you want? And the man said, I don't want anything. You know, just seeing you is good enough. Just a little thing. And, and, and you are vast and powerful. You own everything. Um, you know, one of your dollars is worth a billion of my dollars. So just give me one dollar of yours. God said, all right, wait one second. <laughs> then, uh, so we will get enlightenment, but there's no guarantee that we will get it in this life. If you try hard enough, this life, Yoga Sutra says. Um, that is one. The second answer I gave was, once one one gets the taste of spiritual life, then uh, there's nothing that compares to it. If you tell people who are complaining, I'm not getting peace of mind, my mind goes here and there in meditation, then stop. Give it up, go back to what you were doing like everybody else, you know. <laughs> no, no, I can't stop. This is the most precious thing. Yes, they say that is the most precious. We cannot stop. I remember when I joined the order as a brahmachari, as a new monk, novice monk, Within a few weeks, foolishness, you know, at that age, I thought nothing is happening. A few, a few weeks, not even a month. And I asked another um, brahmachari, a senior, I was too scared to go to the same monks, but the brahmachari asked. I said, uh, you know, I don't think there's, I'm making any progress. Nothing is happening. And then he immediately gave us such a nice answer, I still remember. He said, good, go back. <laughs> I said, no, 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 I can't do that. He said, the life which you have led for the last 23 years, within three weeks that has become impossible for you. Is that not enough progress? <laughs> so once we get the taste of spiritual life, nothing compares to it. You will go on um, practicing this. Then the professor told me, those two are good answers, Swami, but they are a little theoretical. I will give you a practical answer. Why people come to this path and stick to this path? Because... Quite apart from nirvana, moksha, jivan mukti, brahma jnana, enlightenment, and all of that, the day-to-day -day benefits we all get from spiritual life, the meaningfulness of life, the purposefulness, the peace of mind, um, this the strength to live life and to meet the huge challenges of life, the shocks of life, all of this we get from spiritual life. That's why we stick to spiritual life, which is a very good answer. So this was one question.
Okay, let me, instead of trying to organize at this point, let me quickly see some of these and then answer. Where can one learn Kashmiri Shaivism in India? Um, there are these study groups, but first I will tell you there are very good books nowadays. Many of the books have been translated, especially Shiva Sutras. That is the source book. And there are multiple translations of Shiva Sutras available. I know of two, two or three good ones. One uniformly good source is Jaidev Singh. Jaidev Singh's books published by Motilal Banarsi Das. So Shiva Sutras. Uh, if nothing else, if you read the introduction, it's an extensive introduction, you get a good view of all of Kashmiri Shaivism. Um, what are the main teachings, the texts, teachers? Then um, there are books like Vigyana Bhairava. Oh, by the way, let me just uh, mention this. We have a very interesting program coming up at the Vedanta Society of New York on 7th June, 7th June evening at 7.30 Eastern Time. Um, it will be li live uh, streamed on YouTube, so you can see it. Professor Arindam Chakravarti from the University of Hawaii. So he's passing through New York and he's going to give a talk on a meditation technique in Vigyana Bhairava. Uh, so in Vigyana Bhairava is a Kashmiri Shaiva text which contains 112 meditation techniques, each independently guaranteed to take, not guaranteed, um, claiming to take you to enlightenment. So 112 meditation techniques. I have taught one of those meditation techniques which I personally practiced a little bit with some benefit. So I taught that. If you look, uh, meditation in Kashmiri Shaivism, I have given a talk. But he is going to talk about another one of those techniques. And the whole talk, there will be taught by him and a response from me. That's 7th June, uh, evening 7.30. On, you can see it live on YouTube. So you can learn, there are, there are groups. I myself studied in one such group, online group. It became online after the COVID started, so I was able to participate in it. I studied for about a year in that group. Um, so there are groups which study. The thing is, uh, the lineage of practitioners has, has sort of disappeared. The last one in Kashmir itself was Swami Lakshmanju. So some lineages here and there, they practice the teachings are based on Kashmiri Shaivism. But if you want to learn about it, there are a uh, number of good books available now. The Doctrine of Vibration, published by the State University of New York. What is free will versus destiny? What is the role of karma in the framework of Vedantic oneness? Okay. First, let me take up karma. Everybody is interested in karma. I was surprised. Karma is not spirituality. Spirituality is coming out of karma. Breaking free of karma is spirituality. Karma is causality, cause and consequence. You do something, there are results. Actions have consequences. Causes have effects. That is karma. As Swami Vivekananda put it simply, good, good, bad, bad, and none escape the law. Whosoever wears a form, wears the uh, chain to form means body mind and there's a chain attached to it which has produced this body mind past karma which will manifest in this life as pleasant and unpleasant things in your life now that is not spirituality coming out of it breaking free of it that is spirituality Swami Vivekananda says none escape the law but far beyond name and form is Atman ever free no thou art that sannyasi bold Say Om Tat Sat Om, this is poem. So going beyond the law of karma, breaking free of causality, that is spirituality. Notice every path. Karma yoga. Karma is action. When we do action to get something, that is karma. When I do action to be free of karma, that is karma yoga. And what kind of action is that? Unconditional action, selfless action. I am doing, giving that, this time and energy and uh, this body, I am letting it go for the service of others, not expecting anything back in return. This is breaking free from the uh, law of karma. Law of karma is give and take, cause and effect. I, don't wa I will do good. I don't want the result of good. So, um, that it breaks free of karma. Bhakti. See, love. There is a kind of love which only wants to take and does not give. Selfish, tamasic. There is a kind of love which is rajasic, give and take. But there is a sattvic love, the, the spiritual love, 
which gives and does not want anything back in return. That is again, giving without wanting anything back in return. Unconditional love. This is karma yoga. See, unconditional. That is breaking free of karma. Condition is karma. And then jnana, knowledge, it shows you that which what we talked about, consciousness itself beyond the law of karma. There is no cause and effect there. Cause and effect is an appearance. The universe is an appearance. Cause and effect is part of maya. It's an appearance in consciousness. That's what we talked about now. So it's beyond, um, jnana yoga takes you beyond karma, raja yoga, bhakti yoga, karma yoga, all of it takes you beyond karma. People are fascinated by karma. Um, I think one reason we get scared of karma is, I have done lots of bad things, I'm going to suffer. And here is the law of karma telling me I'm going to pay all the bills, I can't escape. Um, the way out there is twofold. Karma yoga itself suggests, keep on doing good. The more you build up your stock of karma, good karma, punya, the, it pushes the bad karma to the back and that will not be activated. You just need a lot of good karma to attain spiritual life and get free of karma. So good karma, doing consistently doing good without any selfish motive, it's a very good idea. And the other is catching hold of that which is beyond karma, God. In, in the bhakti traditions, one name given to God is Karmadhyaksha, Gita, Dhataram Sarvasya, the one who is the support of everything, the support of the law of karma, the lord of karma, who gives the results of karma. Now if you catch hold of the, the CEO of the banking system, of the bank, he can extend you a line of credit when you don't deserve it. He will not call you uh, on your loans even when it should be called in. That power is there with the CEO. Similarly, catch hold of God, by the grace of God, we may be given some leave. For what? Not for any worldly purpose, so that I can make a mess of things again, not for that. <laughs> only for God realization, only for spiritual progress. God helps. The Holy Mother has said that um, by bhakti, by devotion, where one's leg might have been cut off, you will feel a pinprick. You will get something, but much, much less than what it could have been, much less uh, terrible. So karma, we have to uh, go beyond karma. Spirituality is going beyond causality. At the level of the world, karma keeps us in line. If you are aware that uh, good, good, and bad, bad, if that kind of thing we hold on to, we will try to be moral. We will try to avoid the immoral in our actions, in our thought and speech. We will try. Because we are aware of the consequences. Uh, so morality, karma, is one of the reasons why persons should be moral. I remember one person, it was a sadhu, he was saying, when people in, uh, say a hundred years ago in, in India, they believed in the law of karma, and now they don't believe, what's the difference? One person he say, uh, in the village, he says, hundred years ago, he would have said, if somebody offered him a bribe, would have said, I can't take the bribe. I have a you know, wife and children, a family to take care of. The consequence will be terrible. I can't do that. And today, 100 years later, a person will say, I have to take a bribe because I have a wife and children. <laughs> so, where's the difference? The difference is somebody accepts the idea of karma and somebody doesn't. One, one person accepts the idea of karma that I cannot get away with it. And the ultimately result will not be good. And sort of implicitly believes it. The other one doesn't believe it. If I can escape the tax man, if I can escape the police and all that, then I can take a bribe, no problem. So doesn't believe in a, any moral law. What is free will versus destiny? Big question. This big question I remember after just becoming a, becoming a monk uh, in this in 2004, I went around in the Himalayas in our ashram in near Dehradun, Kishanpur, just a little further ahead of it is a huge Tibetan monastery. So Tibetans have different schools. Uh, that, the one school is the Gelugpa, which is, uh, whose head is the Dalai Lama, and he's the head of the entire Tibetan Buddhism. But there's another school called the Sakyapa, the Sakya school. The Sakya school, its headquarters is in that big monastery near uh, Kishanpur. If you go in there, it's a huge monastery. There are hundreds of monks, lamas there. 
So I went to meet the head, the president of the entire monastery. I didn't do it by purpose. There was like people were going to offer pranams to him. So I stood in the line. Then people were going there and saw they were going with the problems and prayers and he was blessing them and answering their questions quickly. And it's a long queue and my foolishness, I went and bowed down and I said, I'm a monk of the Ramakrishna order. I have this question. Madhyamika Buddhism, that's their philosophy. And Advaita Vedanta, what is the difference and similarity? So he was a very powerful character. You could see it, radiating power, a huge man. <laughs> um, so he was sitting there, he looked down at me and he smiled. And he said, big question, no time. <laughs> So, what is free will versus free will versus destiny? Big question. And very little time. Because the answer to this will take a whole talk. The best answer that I have found um, for in Vedanta, for example, Swami Vivekananda says that free will is a misnomer. Uh, f there is freedom, but not freedom of the will. The will is in the process, once you come downstream of maya, everything is causality, nothing is free. And beyond maya is freedom, not freedom of the will, but atma is free. Now, uh, the best answer I have found is, again, I mentioned Professor Indam Chakravarti, he wrote a beautiful article, an essay. Why pray to a god who can hear the sound of the anklets on an ant's feet? This is a statement from the Gospel of Sri Ramakrishna, Kathamrita, where Sri Ramakrishna says, in Bengali I'll translate, Ishwar tini kan karke, Ishwar pipreer paer nupure dhoni shunte parin. Anklets, you put anklets on the feet of children. Now imagine anklets put on the feet of an ant. How tiny they would be. And what a tiny sound they would make. But God can hear the sound of that. <laughs> Now the question Professor Chakravarti asks is, why would you want to pray to such a God? Because God knows everything. What's the point of praying? God knows what we want. Why would you want to pray? So having put that question, it's a beautiful work. I mean, it's like a work of philosophical art. Then he goes into the question of free will. And what he does in that essay, it's about 15, 20 pages long, he takes a survey of all the theories of free will available in Western philosophy, Indian philosophy, neuroscience. So he shows um, determinism, why there cannot be free will, the different types of determinism, quickly summarizes each one. Then he shows the arguments for free will, that there can be free will. Uh, and then he shows the arguments for what is called compatibilism, that free will and determinism are compatible. You know how? Determinism means no free will. Everything is um, cause and effect. Free will means I have free choice. I can do this or I, can, I may do that. I, it's up to my will. But determinism and free will can be combined. For example, he says, sim sim simple thing like raising my hand. So I feel I can choose whether to raise my hand or put down my hand. But yes, this raising your hand and putting it down de depends on a causal chain starting with your neurons in the brain to the muscles in the arm, all of that has to function perfectly in a causal chain, then only the arm can be raised. If you don't think so, ask a person who's paralyzed. There is the will. I want to raise the arm, but I cannot raise the arm because the causal chain is broken. The nerves and the muscles, they're not working. So there must be a deterministic chain in order to give you the freedom to raise your hand. So free will and destiny can be combined. Com determinism and free will can be combined. It's called compatibilism. Another example he gives is mathematics. He says, there are certain rules of mathematics. So that does not constrain the freedom of the mathematician. That in fact enables the freedom of the mathematician. There are certain constraints and rules which enables the mathematician to generate theorems and, and prove certain things. If it was chaos, anything could mean anything, then you couldn't do mathematics. So there are different ways of dealing with this free will problem. But what does he do? The, the interesting thing is what he does later on. After having shown this theory, that theory goes to the Indian views, the Nyaya views. He's a Nyaya expert in Nyaya. 
Then he finally comes to a beautiful conclusion. He says that stage one, if you ask, do you feel your free will? We all feel we have free will. I have got freedom. And our civilization is based on the idea of free will. Unless there is free will, law cannot work. For example, you cannot punish somebody for something that the person has not done out of free will. You cannot reward somebody for bravery, which the person has not done. He is constrained to be brave by his neuroscience and neurology. He is constrained to be evil by his neurology. There was this cartoon I saw. Um, the defendant, the prisoner, is telling the judge, Your Honor, my neurons made me do it. then you cannot punish. So you have to attribute free will freely out of choice. This person could have done something else, did something wrong, broke the law, has to be punished. This person could have escaped but fought against uh, the criminals or the enemy and should be rewarded. So free will, we accept free will in everything that we do. Consumer choice. I don't know how much free will there is but it's supposed to be based on uh, free will. So our first answer, is there free will? Yes. Our whole civilization, personal way of life, our psychology all depends on, yes, there is free will. Second answer, no. As you investigate science, neuroscience, physics on one side, neuroscience on the other side, philosophy on the other side, every investigation throws up at least very serious doubts. How can free will exist in a deterministic universe? Or at least in a universe where causality predominates. How can there be free will? And there are many, many strong arguments against free will. So no, there is no free will. And finally, the third level, yes, there is free will. What is that free will? Uh, he, uh, Professor Chakravarti points out that we feel we have free will, stage one. We come to, upon investigation, we come to doubt that there can be anything like free will. And recognizing that the ultimate freedom is only, call it God, Atman, Brahman, call it God. We keep on sacrificing this feeling of free will, which we know that it is not actually free. We keep on acknowledging it's God's will. Naham, naham, tuhu, tuhu. Not I, not I, thou my Lord. That much freedom we have, we think, at least we feel. If I have freedom, then I must, and also I know that this cannot be real. Then I keep on sacrificing this illusion of my own free will by namaha. Namaha means na mama, not mine, not mine, yours. I feel I have free will. It is everything is your will. I keep on recognizing that. Recognizing that means continuous act of surrender and acceptance to the Lord. That is the answer to the question of free will. Very beautiful. I really liked it. It's a very artistic way. Then answer to the question, why pray to a God who, who can hear the anklets on an ant's feet? Because of this. You have the ability to pray. You seem to feel that I can do something, but actually you cannot. It's all God's will. And then recognize that continuously. That is prayer. Recognize it. Moment to moment, acknowledge it. And the acknowledgement of that, that I feel I have free will, actually I don't. It's all your will is surrender. Namaha, Namaha, Namama, I salute you. I continuously pour myself out to you, my Lord. That's a very uh, beautiful uh, answer, I think. I liked it. With all the divinity within, why does it not manifest in people like Putin who give rise to carnage in Ukraine? <laughs> Uh, it's a good question. You see the same question of why is there evil in the world? Why is there suffering in the world? Why is there evil? Why? But, but first of all, let's see the Vedantic, even the Sankhyan answer. Where is evil? Where is good and bad? It's in the mind. It's a tendency in the mind. Uh, an evil person, Hitler or somebody, when they're in deep sleep, are they evil? When that person was a baby, was it an evil baby? No, not really. It's the strong tendencies in the mind which give rise to certain thoughts, speech and actions. It's a conditioned mind and the conditioning is bad, is nasty. It can be terribly damaging with the right set of circumstances. Devastation, war and genocide and all of that can happen. But we are saying that 
each person is not just the mind, not even just the body or the mind. It is this witness consciousness which illumines the mind. That witness consciousness is always pure and it's one. All of us, we are that one consciousness. That's what we are discussing, the oneness of the universe. In that oneness, pure consciousness, there is no evil at all. But the evil is at the level of the mind and the mind is continuously changing. Um, but the answers, as we saw, Sri Ramakrishna gives three answers. Ultimately, why is there so much suffering? Mystery, we cannot know. Maya. You're not satisfied with that? Leela, play of God. You get angry with that? What Leela? <laughs> what is this? <laughs> then ultimate, who are you? I am suffering, but who am I? I don't know. How do we realize that we are pure consciousness? That's what we did, no? there's a whole day. <laughs> yes. Um, but it's a good question for spiritual practice, sadhana. The practice of jnana yoga is not only to think, to re reason that we are pure consciousness, but also to notice. And as I said, when you're listening, listening now, are you not aware? You're listening, yes, but are you not aware? You're concentrating on my words, hopefully, but you are aware. If your mind is wandering here and there, you still, awareness is there. If you see, awareness is there. Close your eyes, you're not seeing anymore, but awareness is there. In all our perceptions, awareness is there. And if you shut down perceptions, awareness will be there. Your thoughts will be revealed in the mind. If you shut down thoughts, awareness will still be there. Logically. That is pure consciousness. And that consciousness is there, that pure consciousness continues to be pure in the midst of all thoughts, feelings, awareness. That is something people don't realize. People think, when I shut down the mind, then it's pure consciousness. When the mind is thinking, when I have thoughts, feelings, emotions, perceptions, impure consciousness. No, consciousness never becomes impure. When you have a movie screen, you're playing a movie, is it an impure screen? And shut off all the movies, switch off the movie, then it's a pure screen. No. Whatever happens on the screen, suppose there's an explosion, screen doesn't explode. Suppose there's a flood, screen doesn't get wet. So whatever happens in the movie does not actually affect the screen. No purity or impurity affects the screen. It's like sky, the vastness of sky. No matter how much smoke is there, it looks like it if we are polluted. You pollute the atmosphere, surely. Global warming and all that. But you, do, you cannot pollute space. Akasha is not polluted by anything that we can do. So we are pure consciousness regardless. However, it's one thing to say that. And another thing to get the benefit from it. So to get the benefit from it, preparation is necessary. We go back to the fourfold qualification we talked about. Sadhana Chatushta. And the practices. Meditation. Ishta Devata, Mantra, Meditation, Devotion. Selfless service, all of these are preparations for the mind. And they have to be, we have to see that we have to be engaged in that. Notice, if I am not enlightened, I need to practice that to get ready for enlightenment. If I am already enlightened, what kind of life will you have? You will notice the life of an enlightened person is basically a manifestation of these yogas. It will be a devoted life, a selfless life, uh, a focused, concentrated life. Not scattered, not selfish not, you know, full of desires for the world. So, the four yogas, in some form, they are there before enlightenment and they'll be there after enlightenment also. So, it's a good idea to do that. I read in a Buddhist text, they call it Dzogchen, which is the closest to Advaita Vedanta, very same. That's why the Tibetan Lama said, oh, it's the same. It's one type of, it's, it's sort of the highest teaching of Tibetan Buddhism, Dzogchen. Uh, so in, in Dzogchen text, text in one place, the Lama is counseling the, um, the student that these are the most advanced teachings. There is no doubt that you are, you and your Guru are the same reality, but never fail to do obeisance and show respect to the Guru. It's no doubt with eyes closed and eyes open, it is the same reality, but never miss a chance for meditation. It's no doubt that in the city and in the forest, it's the same reality, but never miss a chance for going into a retreat. It's no doubt that the true nature, the Buddha nature, is unaffected, unsoiled by good and bad, 
but never give up a chance to do a good deed and never uh, perform imp impure deeds. So you notice, uh, one is the reality, but the other side is always carefully maintained. The practices are carefully maintained. So that's how we realize we are pure consciousness. If everything is consciousness, why manifestation? Why the play? Again, big question. <laughs> There's a short answer to this big question, which I liked. It's either Swami Asheshanji or one of the earlier Swamis who lived on the West Coast, I forget uh, his name. He said that, notice, on our side of enlightenment, we have the question, we don't have the answer. On their side of enlightenment, they have the answer, but not the question. Why does consciousness play? Why is there manifestation? It doesn't seem to have bothered any one of them. <laughs> or all the great enlightened ones you see. It's interesting. They don't seem to think it's a question worth answering anymore. And we seem to think this is the most sophisticated question we can put. If it's all one question, one consciousness, then why is all of this appearing? I can give you two answers. One is a logical answer. The logical answer is this. Um, why is consciousness manifesting as this? The answer would be, what are the options that poor consciousness has? <laughs> One is, there are only two logical options, either manifest or not manifest. And that's what consciousness is doing. In your waking and dreams, manifest in the world or in the dreams. And deep sleep, no manifestation. In the existence of the universe, srishti and stiti, the projection of the universe and the maintenance of the universe, just now like we have, manifestation. In the dissolution of the universe, mahapralaya, no manifestation. So consciousness is producing this manifestation and no manifestation at the cosmic level, at the personal level. What more can poor consciousness do? <laughs> we have only two options and both are given. Somerset Maugham, the um, noticed, uh, noted writer, novelist, uh, he wrote The Razor's Edge, which prompted many people in that generation to take a backpack and a, and a passport and travel to India in search of spirituality. A story of Larry. So he studied Vedanta. He studied that Brahman manifested this universe in his wry and dry British humor, he writes. One feels that Brahman could have left well enough alone. <laughs> Why manifest? So much trouble. Then... So this is one answer. Another answer I can give you is a little more in-depth. Uh, it is that why all this? Well, the answer from an Advaitic perspective is Brahman did not create this universe. It is a play, it is not even play. It is chid vivatta, appearance in consciousness. It is maya, it's an appearance. But then one can again ask, why maya? Why not just Brahman? Because of Maya, Brahman is appearing like this. But why Maya? If you are saying Brahman alone exists, then where is the question of Maya also? So why Maya, if you ask? At that point, Swami Vivekananda says, and Shankara and all of them, they say the question is wrong. Now it took me a quite a long time to understand why the question is wrong. Because from Swami Vivekananda's perspective, it seems very clear the question is wrong. I thought about it. You know, like nagging little kids, they will ask, why Maya? If you, they will not ask why Maya, but... Why? They keep on, whatever you answer, why? Until you tell them to shut, shut up. So if you say, why Maya? And I'm told, why is the question, uh, the question is wrong. I'll ask, why is it wrong? Why is the question wrong? It seems to be a logical question to ask. But the question is wrong because of this. It took me quite a long time to understand, but it's actually pretty simple. When you ask a question, you expect an answer. So when you ask a why question, what kind of answer will satisfy you? Because. You're asking for, why means you're asking for a cause. Why is the grass wet? Because it rained or because of the sprinklers. Why did it rain? Because of the clouds. Because. Why are the clouds? Because of evaporation. Why is there evaporation? Because of the sun. Because. Now if you ask, Maya, why Maya? Then the answer cannot be given because, see, because again. <laughs> uh -huh. 
Causality is a part of Maya. Only after accepting causality you can give a because answer. Why because answer? When you accept causality, you have already accepted Maya. Then you can't ask why Maya. It's like, I'll tell you, another, give you another example and make it clear. Maya is time, space, causation. Desha, Kala, Nimitta. So if you ask time, Maya is time. If you ask what was there before time, but before and after are time words. You've already accepted time. Without time, there is no before and after. If you ask what is outside space, it doesn't make sense. Outside and inside are space words. You've already accepted the concept of space, then only you can ask what is inside and outside. So if you don't accept space, there's no question of asking inside and outside space. If you don't accept time, there's no question of accepting in, um, before time. If you are not accepting Maya itself, then you are not accepting causality. Because. Then you should not ask why Maya. Do you see? It's a little intricate, but it makes sense. It's logically, it shows why you cannot ask this question. And many, many answers can be given. Not all of which, not many of which will uh, be satisfying. But as we said that on that side of enlightenment, there's no question. Here, there's no real answer. Why the play? Uh, so why? Play, of course, you cannot ask why the play. Play is play. You don't do it for a reason. It's like somebody's dancing and you ask, where are you going? I'm not going anywhere, I'm dancing. <laughs> what happens when you reach spiritual realization, enlightenment? What happens to the jiva? Is there perfect knowledge, peace, quiet, happiness? Very easy. Look at the lives of the enlightened ones. What happens beyond the dropping of the, of the body? You say Brahman alone exists, or the one is one with its Buddha nature, whatever you call it, moksha, nirvana. But as long as we can, as far as we can understand, when you see the enlightened ones, you see their lives, that's what happens. There's a description, Gita. Arjuna asks this question to Krishna. What is it like to be enlightened? And Krishna gives answers. Um, Stita pragya, guna atita, multiple times. What is it like to be enlightened? Well, it's a very, uh, can be a tricky question. I remember in the, in the studies of Buddhism, the two kinds of things which are talked about a Buddha, when you're fully enlightened, when you become a Buddha, omniscient, you know everything. And yet, you know the truth. So, everything that is there in this world is false, is shunya, is empty. The Buddha cannot know false things, so Buddha knows nothing. Because it's all false. Why should the Buddha know false things? So is being a Buddha, is it knowing everything or knowing nothing? The professor who taught us this, he called it brainstem Buddha. You're reduced to a brainstem, nothing, no, like a deep coma. Is that enlightenment? Doesn't sound very appealing. You become reduced to your brain, brainstem Buddha. Yeah. So. so yes, but what's the answer? Uh, the answer is that you know things as they are. That from a Vedantic perspective, you will know exactly like anybody else knows. As you are seeing, hearing, smelling, tasting, touching, will the enlightened one be able to see, hear, smell, taste, touch? Yes. Will they see what we are seeing, hear, and smell, and taste what we are hearing? Yes. Look at the lives of the enlightened ones. Don't they recognize people? Don't they eat food? Don't, can't they distinguish between taste as long as their consciousness is outward directed? They are as capable as all of us, more than us, in fact. And yet, no. If you ask them, are you seeing this world and people? They say, yes. Really? No. They'll smile and say, no. <laughs> Nothing prevents an enlightened one from being fully active in the world and yet denying its existence. And let me tell you a story from Yoga Vashishta, one of my favorite stories. Which, by the way, shows the difference between the first lecture today and the second one. There was a queen and a king, of course. All stories are like that. Queen and a king. And the queen was enlightened. The king was not. Now, one day the king asked the queen that, My dear, you are um, so peaceful in the midst of all your duties and activities. You're so calm. How do you do it? 
What's your secret? And she said, I was waiting for you to ask. So she teaches him that actually we are not this body. We are not even this mind. All of that which we discovered in the morning. We are the consciousness to which the body, mind and the world appears. In consciousness, in our real nature, there is no problem at all. Remain there, remain rooted in that, you have absolute peace. Chidananda Rubaha Shivoham Shivoham. Pure consciousness, Satchidananda. Then she taught him the meditation techniques, the Vedantic meditation, how to remain centered in that. The king said, this is wonderful. I wish I had asked you earlier, so I'm going to go on a sabbatical. You manage the kingdom. I'm going to realize this. So he goes off to the forest. He's a king, so in the forest also he has a palace or something like that. So there he spends time in meditation, study, and trying to realize what his wife taught him, while the wife is running the kingdom. Then he realizes, he gets the breakthrough, Brahma Jnana, I mean this enlightenment, I am the witness consciousness. And um, like Narendranath, when he got the first Nirvikalpa Samadhi, Sri Ramakrishna asked him, what do you want? He said, I want to remain there. Once in a while I'll come down for a snack, and go up there again and, and remain there. Sri Ramakrishna scolded him, luckily for us. He said, I thought, fie on you, I thought you will be like a great banyan tree under which people of the world were suffering. Uh, they will come and find shade and comfort. Here you are thinking only of your own liberation. So, luckily, that's why we are all able to enjoy all this <laughs> because of Sri, uh, what Sri Ramakrishna told Vivekananda. But the king realized, and he said what uh, Narendranath had said at first, I want to stay there. This world is a dream. Why stay in a dream? So he stays, meditation stays there. Then after some time, he got a doubt. So he came back to the capital where the queen was running the kingdom very nicely. So he said, my dear, whatever you said, was right. And I practiced and I've realized you are my guru and I thank you. I'm eternally grateful. So the queen said, I sense a but somewhere. <laughs> said, you are right. But I have a question. You have realized this long before me. I have also realized it. And I, I want to enjoy that wonderful peace and there's nothing that compares, comes close to it. But you have realized it. But I see you are a very ordinary life you're leading. You are doing all the work of the queen and daily, busy throughout day and night. Uh, why don't you want to remain like me, absorbed in the peace of samadhi, in the peace of the pure consciousness? The queen said, I was waiting for you to ask. <laughs> then she teaches that what you see as a false world, and you turn away from it into the reality of samadhi within, is also exactly that same consciousness which you have discovered within. There is nothing here which is a second reality apart from the reality which you have discovered within. Pure consciousness, Atman, Brahman, what you have discovered, this is also that. Sri Ramakrishna said, with eyes closed, God is there. With eyes open, God is not there. What kind of God is this? What you see with eyes closed is exactly what you see with eyes open. The same Brahman, formless existence, consciousness, bliss, is the kingdom and the men and the women and the animals and plants and sky and earth exactly same, all radiant with divinity. It's all action. Your official actions, your personal actions, everything is shining with that divinity. We chant it every day. We think it's chanting for food. Brahma arpanam brahmavi, brahma agno brahmanahutam, brahmhevate nagantavyam, brahma karma samadhina who sees Brahman in action, Brahma Karma Samadhi, whose Samadhi is in the midst of intense action. You see the radiance of divinity everywhere. That person realizes Brahman. Not withdrawing and sitting in the forest in your uh, palace. So this is the second talk which we had, the oneness of all existence. If truth is one, why did science and Vedanta arrive at incompatible conclusions? Science says uncertain, incomplete and non-absolute is the truth. Vedanta says truth is absolute, complete, which can be arrived at through logical analysis. Should we discard science or Vedanta or reconcile both? Reconcile both, of course. Only thing is, science is not a finished product. Science, the quest is going on. And notice, the direction of science is encouraging. I'm not saying science is where Vedanta is. And it's, it's also uh, worthwhile to, 
and to follow science as it develops because we live in an age of science. We cannot say Vedanta is a complete system, we don't have no, any need of science, come to Vedanta. I know a physicist who was very shocked when he went to a well-known Vedanta, Advaita Vedanta teacher and the, said, the teacher asked him, what do you do, Swami? He asked him, what do you do? And the physicist said, I do physics. Ah, all that is Maya. Come here, I will teach you the truth. This is shocking. Swami Vivekananda's attitude was not like that. You see, that's why Tesla uh, used to come and attend uh, Vivekananda's lectures. Uh, Vivekananda was in dialogue with William James, with Tesla. Some of them were more convinced than the others, but it's important to have that dialogue. This is an age of science. Uh, if you think Shankara, Nagarjuna, Buddha, if they had lived today, would they have not been interested in science? They would have been interested in science. Certainly. But um, where is it going? Again, I, I mentioned, for example, someone straightforward, completely in the scientific paradigm like Brian Greene. So I asked him, when he launched his book at Harvard University, I asked him this question. The claims of the Upanishads and the claims of modern physics and the findings of modern physics, um, uh, how do you see them together? And it's good to ask him. His, his, he does, many, many people don't know. His elder brother is a monk, a Hindu monk. <laughs> so he said, I have, always, I have had this debate with my brother many times. His position is what you are saying, what you are discovering in physics is what these ancient Indian scriptures, Hindu scriptures have spoken about for a long time. Now, what is his view? And he told me his very considered view from a completely scientific perspective. He said that... Uh, what you are talking about in the Upanishads, in Vedanta, is not science. But it is a poetic rendition of the same principles which we are talking about. Which is fine. Which is, I think, correct. Which is a very good thing to say. And as I said, whether it's Heisenberg or today it's Brian Greene, if you see the, their final conclusions about the world, universe, you know, about ourselves, very, very philosophical. I won't say Vedantic, but definitely very philosophical. You can clearly see physics merging into metaphysics there. All of them. All of the thinkers were thinking about this world. In fact, there's a book uh, which I like very much. Jim Holt, Why Does the World Exist? So this, he's a science journalist, and he has written this very nice little book, Why Does the World Exist? We, what he has done is he has gone to cutting-edge physicists, Mathematicians, philosophers, theologians, people from literature across the world, including physicists like Roger Penrose and all, and he has put this question. Not why star exists or molecule exists or life exists. Why does anything exist at all? Why is there existence at all? That's the ultimate question, the deepest question. So why? What is an answer from science, from mathematics, from philosophy, from uh, religion, from literature? And so that book is a collection of all the uh, answers he has got. And in pretty good depth, not oversimplified. So I was looking through it and I was thinking, what, will he ever come to Vedanta? What happens is towards the end, he is talking to a very well-known American philosopher, Robert Nozick. Robert Nozick. Uh, who passed away, I think, re who passed recently, a few years ago. And they're discussing the nature of mind, consciousness, and reality. And then at one point, Robert Nozick says, who knows, you know, everything else, every, every theory is failing. Who knows, maybe the ancient Hindus were right, Atman is Brahman. That is the solution to everything. <laughs> and he does not pursue that any further. But I was, yes, like you, yay. <laughs> So good, let's see where it goes. The direction is good. For the first time in science, in the, since the beginning of modern science, for the first time we are living in an age, in a time where consciousness has become the square, centered focus of scientific study. People were not interested in it 20 years ago. Christoph Koch, who is a leading uh, consciousness uh, studies expert, he was the chief scientist of the Paul Allen Brain Institute. He says that, when I entered this field and I said, I'm going to study consciousness in neuroscience, I'm going to study consciousness from neuroscience perspective, my colleagues told me, you're, you're, it's career suicide. You'll never find anything in this field. So, but now it is a hot topic. If you see in the, 
uh, internet, every week there will be an article, consciousness explained, or the mystery of consciousness, two kinds of articles, you can't explain, others is explained. I always say the consciousness explained articles are always consciousness explained within brackets away, explained away. <laughs> So uh, science, I think the direction of science is, uh, is very promising. And if we do come to these truths, so somebody would say that, why, why have science? If you're going, ultimately you think it's going to come to the same truth? No, it's not exactly the same truth. The way science will come to it uh, will, is, um, will, be, will add great amount of richness, depth and practicality to our understanding of the truth. There's, there's a reason why His Holiness the Dalai Lama insists on neuroscience and studies of meditation, effects of meditation, brain science, and Buddhist ideas of consciousness and meditation. And so this meeting of science and spirituality, it's a very good idea. Vivek, Swami Vivekananda was all for it. He was all for it. Okay, we're almost out of time. All, many big questions and no time. There's so many good questions, my God. You mention about your lessons in Harvard in almost every class. Oh, do I? I shouldn't stay. <laughs> is it really important to go through that material taught there? No, no, no. Why is it important? If you're a spiritual seeker, and then you don't have to go to Harvard or attend a philosophy class, all the material taught in the philosophy departments in the university is all easily available. And in good books, non-textbook material. It's written in many nice books which are which gives you an overview of the idea, of, of the conclusions of these uh, philosophers and thinkers. And you get a good idea, if you're interested. And see, the entire, like I mentioned, I studied Buddhism, but it was a particular kind of Buddhism. A classical Indian Buddhism for thousand years in India, plus Tibetan Buddhism. But there's other Buddhism which I did not study. And like Buddhism, how it developed in China, in Japan. And people have assured me, what you are trying to say actually has been said in um, not so much in Tibetan Buddhism, but rather in Chinese Buddhism, it is much closer to Advaita Vedanta. Now that's some material I, I don't know yet. So if you have interest, yes, but otherwise it's enough. Uh, if you hold on to take up one path and follow it seriously. Sri so Ramakrishna talks approvingly of the monk he saw in Dakshineshwar, He's seriously studying a book. And then he saw, what is it there in that book? Every page is written Ram, 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 you know, throughout. Only one word. And seriously studying it as if a uh, thriller is going to. <laughs> that is focus, a study there. I read about this monk in Haridwar, Shankarananda, long time before our time. Our Swami Dhireshanandaji met him and wrote a Hindi description about him. So somebody asked this monk, who was said to be a radical non dualist, Advaitin. He would live in a, on a cot under a tree, not even an ashram or a cave or a cottage, um, but in a cot, on a cot under a tree. And he wore only a loincloth and no possessions at all. But people thought he was enlightened, fully enlightened, he was an extraordinary character. Somebody went and said, you are a non-dualist, Advaitin, where are your books? Because non-Vedantins have lots of books. <laughs> They're always studying and arguing, where are your books? And the Swami said, oh, I have three books and I read them every day. And they all tell me the truth. The three books are Waking, Dreaming and Deep Sleep, Jagrat, Swapna, Sushupti. And they tell me that I am the witness consciousness, the fourth, the Turiya. That's enough. Sri so Ramakrishna told Swami Turiyananda. Turiyananda, as a young man, he stopped coming to Sri Ramakrishna. He was very engaged in reading Vedanta, arguing, meditating on trying to realize Brahman. Then Sri Ramakrishna called him once and said to him, I've heard you are you are too busy to come to, come to me, no? that you are studying Vedanta. I said, so all that is very good. But all your Vedanta texts, all of it, isn't it that they tell you Brahman is real and the world is false? If that is so, then why not give up the world and try to realize Brahman? And that sort of revolutionized Swami Turiyananda's life. I find the gold jewelry, that means the example, incomplete, as we can convert one kind of jewelry to another by melting it in a lab, we cannot do that for any conscious being. Then how can we say that there's one common consciousness if we cannot demonstrate? We can demonstrate. Don't try to melt anybody in a lab. <laughs> that's what, that's what we've been trying to say all along. The form and the name, you don't have to melt. It's continuously melting and changing. Day is changing into evening, into night. 
ದಿನಯಾಮಿನ್ಯೌ ಸಾಯಂ ಪ್ರಾತ ಶಿಶಿರ ವಸಂತೌ ಪುನರಾಯಾತ ಕಾಲ ಕ್ರೀಡತಿ ಗಚ್ಚತಿ ಆಯು ಶಂಕರಾಚಾರ್ಯ ಸಿಂಗ್ಸ್ ಡೇ ಪ್ಯಾಸಿಸ್ ಇನ್ ಟು ಈವ್ನಿಂಗ್ ಮಾರ್ನಿಂಗ್ ಇನ್ ಟು ನೈಟ್ ವೀಕ್ಸ್ ಆ್ಯಂಡ್ ಮಂತ್ಸ್ ಆ್ಯಂಡ್ ಇಯರ್ಸ್ ರೋಲ್ ಬಾಯ್ ಟೈಮ್ ಇಸ್ ಪ್ಲೇಯಿಂಗ್ ಲೈಫ್ ಇಸ್ ಫ್ಲೋಯಿಂಗ್ ಬಾಯ್ ವೆನ್ ವಿಲ್ ಯು ರಿಯಲೈಸ್ ಗಾಡ್ ಭಜ ಗೋವಿಂದ ಮಿಸೇಸ್ ವಾಟ್ ವೇದಾಂತ ಸೇಸ್ ದೇರ್ ಇಸ್ ಆಸ್ ಆಲ್ ದಿಸ್ ಇಸ್ ಚೇಂಜಿಂಗ್ ಕಾನ್ಶಿಯಸ್ನೆಸ್ ಇಸ್ ಕಾನ್ಸ್ಟೆಂಟ್ ನೋಟಿಸ್ ದ್ಯಾಟ್ ದಟ್ಸ್ ವಾಟ್ ವಿ ಆರ್ ಟ್ರೈಂಗ್ ಟು ಪಾಯಿಂಟ್ ಔಟ್ ದಟ್ ವರ್ಸ್ ಇನ್ ದ ಪಂಚದಶಿ weeks months years eons ages universes come and go the sun of consciousness is neither rises nor sets it's constant and shining that's like the gold in the ornament you can keep on changing the ornament it's the same gold nothing uh, no changes come there it's exactly the same gold i remember i can't but tell you this funny incident which happened when i gave this example this was in fiji and uh, i was going to give a vedanta talk they knew i was going to give a vedanta talk the swami there before i started the vedanta talk he he became anxious about something he came and whispered to me that uh, in your vedanta talk give some examples and then but don't give that jeweler example which ram krishna has given because in the audience there are many jewelers <laughs> what is the jeweler example that a man about about frauds in spiritual life so a man goes to a jewelry shop and the man outside is chanting from inside somebody chants keshava keshava name of krishna the man who is sitting outside is repeating the name of god and he says gopala gopala and then inside somebody shouts hari 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 uh, name of god and the man outside shouts hara 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 like in name of shiva and this man thought how the customer thought how religious these people are how devout they must be really honest people but they were cheats because what he was asking this is a play on words it works in hindi and uh, bengali it works keshava keshava in bengali it means who are they who is coming what kind of customer give me a read on them <laughs> keshava keshava and this man says gopala gopala name of krishna but gopala means a herd of cows <laughs> they are foolish <laughs> then the man inside says hari hari Uh, hari is the name of vishnu but also it means should i steal should i rob them blind <laughs> hari uh, haran that to to rob and the man outside says hara hara go ahead go ahead rob them rob them <laughs> the swami whispered to me don't give that example <laughs> i said i said i have give me some credit of common sense i will not give that example but you warned me there are jewelers in this uh, Uh, so then i gave a talk and i gave this gold and jewelry example the gold is melted made into another form it's exactly the same no changes happen it's the same thing after the talk one jeweler came stormed up uh, furiously he said in hindi he said swami humko to duba denge aap you are going to sink my business why because i know it's the same thing but when we melt it and then we charge it we say it's a new thing which has come <laughs> if you say it's nothing it's just the same we say we try to present it as a new it's a you just you just gave me the material but i have given you a new necklace see that's how the business operates and you are going to put us in trouble <laughs> is it the only way to feel or experience oneness in samadhi again um, samadhi is a yogic thing vedanta is the enlightenment the brahmakara vritti which comes through vichara that also gives you oneness or devotion also the clear uh, the clarity that god is everything that's also oneness advaita vedanta would ins- uh, insist that you go through the path of inquiry and realize that it's oneness is an ex- existing oneness it should become clear to you but samadhi is also important sri ramakrishna says in the gospel in one place and the exact words are samadhi na hole thik thik hoy na unless one is absorbed at least once in samadhi it will not uh, how do you put thik thik it will not sit right you will have doubts you will have a tinge of uh, the complete clarity which comes from seeing it 
in a world shut down and the oneness and nothing but that oneness, after that you cannot doubt anymore. So samadhi has its own place. And it, in Advaita Vedanta they say samadhi is useful for clearing up, negating past samskaras. So they also recommend stay with it. Once you realize oneness, stay with that oneness. In samadhi, again and again, plunge the mind into it. So that past samskaras are that the deconditioning takes place. This is called nididhyasana. Okay, one more we'll do. Lot of good questions. Once we have a guru, uh, we have submitted our will to him, should we discontinue the array of questions? Uh, no, you should start the array of questions. But you are right in one sense. I remember when I joined the order, the Swami who was in charge of the ashram, every day I would ask questions. He would give us opportunities, new brahmacharis to ask questions. And I had so many questions. Then one day I felt I was bugging him. And I thought, he's a Swami for the last 40, 50 years. How many times he must have been asked these questions? So he must be getting irritated with me. So I said, I'm sorry for asking all these questions. And uh, does it irritate you? Do you get tired of it? He said two things. Um, first of all, no, why should I get tired? We, beautiful answer he, get, he gave. We are both walking on the same path. It's very nice to discuss these things. Why should I get tired? Second, many questions. He said, ask all the questions. Don't worry. Very soon you won't have anything more to ask. You will know things for sure and then you know what is to be done. Another Swami um, whom, from whom I was learning Upanishads, after the class, I was a new uh, brahmachari. And, and I still remember in front of Belurmat gate, I hesitantly said, Swami, I have a question. I thought, maybe can I ask? And Swami said, ask away, fire away, whatever questions you have. Better brains than yours for more last 1500 to 5000 years have been asking questions and all the questions have been answered satisfactorily. So you need not be af afraid that by a couple of your questions, Vedanta will come crashing down. <laughs> <laughs> ask away, whatever. <laughs> Better brains than yours have thought over this for millennia. So, yes, please ask questions. Om Shanti 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 Hari Om Tat Sat Shri Ram Krishna Rupanamastu